Welcome to Train Signal. You are watching vSphere Distributed Switch in depth. In this lesson, we're going to take a deep dive into the vSphere Distributed Switch, which is the second type of virtual switch included with vSphere. So we'll start off with just kind of a quick overview of what is the vSphere Distributed Switch, then terms and ideas, design considerations, best practice, and recommendations when you're deploying the VDS or vSphere Distributed Switch into your environment, configuring the main vSphere Distributed Switch and port groups, and finally, a quick note about upgrading your virtual distributed switch version as you roll up to new versions of vSphere. Uh, we're not going to talk so much about migrating to the VDS in this lesson. That's going to be the next lesson. This one will be mainly about the configuration, deployment, kind of some design recommendations, things like that. So with that, let's go ahead and let's get started. So what exactly is the vSphere Distributed Switch? Well, simply put, you know, we've talked about this a little bit. There's two types of virtual switch included with VMware, or vSphere really. There's the standard vSwitch, and then the vSphere Distributed Switch, or VDS. And again, you'll sometimes hear me call it the Distributed Switch, the vSphere Distributed Switch. This thing has gone through a couple of iterations of naming, but now with vSphere 5, VMware's kind of settled on vSphere Distributed Switch or VDS, but please excuse me if I sometimes insert other names out of bad habit. But this is the second type of vSwitch, and it's normally considered to be easier to administer for medium and larger environments, or really even for smaller environments. It's just, you know, you don't get that efficiency of scale. The, the thing about it is, is that with the standard vSwitch, I have a vSwitch configuration on every single host. If I have 10 vSphere hosts, and I want to add a port group, I make that port group on each host. Now, you can do things with like host profiles, you can script, you can do different things to kind of automate that, but in the end, you have 10 different discrete configurations, 10 different vSwitches, and you know, the risk of a configuration mismatch on one of those causing a problem. With the distributed switch, you really have one switch, or you can have multiple distributed switches, but a single distributed switch across a bunch of different hosts. And the idea being is you configure it once, or you create a port group, and it's pushed down to all of your hosts. So you're not managing individual things, and you get really a more correct or consistent configuration across your hosts. It also gives you some features that you don't get with the standard vSwitch. There's network I.O. control, which we'll talk about in a later lesson as we talk about rate limiting. But it allows you to have granular control for giving bandwidth to different types of traffic. You can do share, similar to what we do with CPU and memory. You can do limits, again, similar to CPU and memory. And you can tag it for quality of service policies, things like that. There's port mirroring. Port mirroring is very cool. Before, with the standard vSwitch, or now I guess with the standard vSwitch, if you wanted to kind of sniff traffic from going to and from a VM, you would normally put, you know, another VM on the same host as the one you're trying to do a packet capture, run something like Wireshark to look at the data, make sure you set everything to promiscuous mode, you know, you want to set the vSwitch for that, you want to set the VM for that, and then you could kind of pick up the traffic. But if that VM, that target VM you were looking at, was vMotion to another host, either you know on purpose or with DRS, you'd kind of have to chase it down. Or you'd have to sniff traffic on the physical switches, and again, if a VM moved, you'd have to chase it down. With the distributed switch, you can do port mirroring. You can say, I want to mirror all traffic in and out of that VM over there to this VM right here, and if those two VMs move around, it doesn't matter. The VDS handles it. And we'll talk about that again in a later lesson. There's NetFlow, which allows you to pull traffic and IP statistics off the switch. We will go over that. Private VLANs, which allow you to do kind of like VLANs within VLANs, which we cover in the VLANs lesson. And ingress and egress traffic shaping. If you look at the standard V switch, you'll see that there's an option for traffic shaping where you set average, peak, and burst throughput. But if you look at it, it really only supports traffic going one way, whereas the distributed switch does ingress and egress. And again, we talk about that in a later lesson when we talk about network I.O. control. But you can see that you don't just get this kind of environment-wide or cluster-wide switch. You get a lot of other features with it. And what you're finding is that's where VMware is putting a lot of R&D. So some terms and ideas. So right here I say the DB switch architecture. Really, that should be the VDS architecture. But the distributed switch architecture has two main components. There's what you call the management or control plane, which you know kind of runs the operation. It's responsible for all configuration and management, and it's integrating into vCenter. Then there's the I.O. or data plane. 
And the, that handles data flow in and out of each vSphere host. And it's kind of made up of some hidden vSwitches on each vSphere host that's part of the distributed switch. These are kind of things that you don't really see. Uh, say here there's no extra modules or components to install. Unlike, say, Cisco's Nexus 1000V where you literally install the control or management plane, which is a virtual supervisor module, and you install the I.O. or data plane, which is what called the virtual Ethernet module, or VEM. With the distributed switch with vSphere, you don't do any of that. Management is built into vCenter. Everything you need for data connections are built into vSphere, and you don't have to worry about backing anything else up, managing it, dealing with it. It's all integrated. So what do you need to use the VDS? Well, the primary requirement is Enterprise Plus licensing. What you're seeing is VMware is really pushing new features into Enterprise Plus. Things slowly trickle down to Enterprise. We've seen a few things like third-party multipathing for storage and some other features kind of flow down. But really, all the cool new stuff is ending up in Enterprise Plus, and the distributed switch is no different. So you got to have that. But above and beyond that, there's really nothing you need. There's no special hardware requirements. I don't require you to have a certain brand physical switch, certain brand or capability network card. You know, pretty much anything that will work with the vSwitch works with the distributed switch. So there's no issues there. It's really down to a discussion around licensing, and it's just one of those great features that you get with Enterprise Plus. Are there any downsides to the distributed switch? Well, for the most part, really not. I mean, it's pretty much all upside. There is a reliance on vCenter. So, you know, one thing that used to kind of be the case back when we didn't have all this integration with vCenter was that vCenter was fairly disposable. Disposable meaning if you didn't care about recreating resource pools or roles and permissions, things like that, you could basically blow away vCenter, rebuild it, ready to go, you're good. So if you lost it, yeah, it wasn't a great day, but it wasn't a terrible day. You didn't take an outage. But with the distributed switch, there is a reliance on vCenter. Now, vCenter can go down, and you'll be fine. You know, VMs will stay up, tasks and all this stuff will normally run, traffic will continue to flow. You're not going to be able to make any real changes to the switch. There's some things you won't be able to do, but again, you're not in, an, in a down or outage situation. But you do want to make sure vCenter is, you know, resilient. So you want to back up the vCenter database. You may want to use something like, you know, vCenter Heartbeat or, you know, just use standard HA from VMware, things like that. But you need to make sure that you start treating vCenter as a tier one infrastructure type application. Again, it can go down and it's fine, but you don't want to have that, you know, be a long kind of long term thing. You don't want to be down for a couple of days. You are going to start having some issues as things can't you know, attached to the switch, or if you want to reboot a VM, or, you know, something, some things are just going to be effective. It's also easier to rebuild a standard vSwitch via the command line if needed. Now, that's one of the issues, and it's getting a little bit better. There's some, you know, troubleshooting commands and things we have now, especially with vSphere 5, but in the end, if you say, Jason, sit down at a console and build me a distributed virtual switch from the ground up, you're going to have a hard time with that. Whereas if you said, build me a standard vSwitch, you know, the networking's gotten screwed up and I need you to rebuild this thing manually, I can do that no problem with a standard vSwitch. Now, if you do end up in a situation where a host is offline due to a bad configuration, you can go to the DCUI, that's that, you know, console for ESXi, and there is an option there to rebuild the standard network management vSwitch. And basically that will get you back online, then you can bring the host back into the distributed switch, fix any problems, and you're good to go but it's not as simple as it is with a vSwitch to go in there and just build a new vSwitch or attach things or move things around. The other downside, and I just mentioned this in the last slide, is licensing. I mean, Enterprise Plus costs more. There's no doubt about it. I work for a partner. I sell a lot of this stuff. I know what it costs. I know it's a, it's a hefty charge to go from Enterprise to Plus, but you get the VDS. You get network I.O. control. You get load-based teaming, which, you know what, I don't even think I mentioned on the benefits slide that you know, we talk about in the hashing algorithms section of one of the lessons. So you get a lot of things along with you know, storage I.O. control, storage DRS, host profiles, all these other things that you get in Enterprise Plus. But I think network I.O. control as part of the VDS is a really good one. So I think that helps kind of you know, explain the cost. But those are pretty much it. You know, reliance on vCenter, so make sure that's protected. In a troubleshooting situation, it's not quite as easy with the command line and licensing.
So some design considerations. So designing the deployment of your VDS can be simple or it can be a bit more involved. It really depends on the depth of features and how you plan to use it. It also depends on how you want to physically separate traffic. Now if you think about it with a standard vSwitch, if I want to have you know storage traffic run over two dedicated NICs, I can basically build a vSwitch, add those two NICs as my uplinks, and then add any port groups or you know VM kernels for NFS and iSCSI. With the VDS, it's a little different, and we'll talk about this here, and, and we'll go over how you do traffic separation, but there's some options there, and it can make things a little bit more complicated. It's not bad, it's just different. Uh, it's suggested to start with a basic deployment, and then starting adding in features such as network I.O. control. You know, Don't deploy this thing 100%, make all your QoS settings, and then roll things over to it. You want to kind of you know ease into some of those more advanced settings, but overall, you know, designing the VDS is not a big deal. So let's jump to the lab. This is going to be a quick lab because step one, we're just going to create the distributed switch. And really, that doesn't do anything except create a distributed switch. It's not going to bring any hosts in. It's not going to roll any VMs over, anything like that. We're just going to create a new switch. We're going to create an example port group and show you the basic installation options. So with that, let's go ahead and let's jump on over to the lab. Okay, here we are back again in the lab, and we will start by taking a look at inventory networking. So you can go inventory networking, oops, or you can go back to home and networking here, really up to you. I've already got one distributed switch already created right there, Nash Lab BDS. You know, we haven't talked about traffic separation and some things yet, but you can have multiple distributed switches. You don't have to have one. A host, you know, one of my vSphere hosts can belong to multiple vSphere distributed switches. And so we could have one be dedicated for storage, one for VM traffic, or we can do everything with one. And again, we'll talk about pros and cons a little bit later. But this is one right here. So let's go ahead and act like we're going to create a new one. So we want to go up to my data center here. We're going to add a vSphere distributed switch. You can click that, or you can right-click here. I'm a big fan of right-click, so we'll do that. New vSphere distributed switch. So it's first it's going to ask you for the version. This is kind of important, <laughs> you know, if you have a mixed mode cluster or you're going to have a distributed switch used by multiple clusters, which again is an option, you're going to want to pick the version, the lowest common denominator. So if I've got a 4.0, a 4.1, and a 5.1 set of clusters, and I want them all to use the same switch, you better choose 4.0 the other guys aren't going to be able to support it. If you're all 5.0, choose 5.0 because if you want to use some of the new options like NetFlow, port mirroring, and IOC, we got to be a 5.0 version switch. So it's very easy. We're going to go over that later about how we do an upgrade, but just pick the lowest common denominator. Click Next. Then you need to give the switch a name. So that is what I put here, Nash Lab VDS. So let's just do Lesson Lab VDS. And so we'll see that. Then you're going to need to pick the number of uplink ports. So this is one of those things people always look at me funny when I explain. And, you know, I didn't make this stuff up, so, you know, don't blame me. But bottom line here is that if your servers, all your servers have, or actually, you know, if you have servers, look at the most, you know, the one with the most uplinks, the one with the most physical ports. If you have servers with eight physical ports, make it eight. If you have most or four, make it four. You can come back later and change this. So if you, you got eight now and you add two more later, you can come back in and make this ten. And what it is, it's talking about the maximum number of physical adapters per host. So if I put 10 here, it make, puts 10 right here. My lab, we're limited to 4, so I'm going to do 4. Again, I can come back in later and change this. So why don't you just set it to a large number up front? Well, a couple of things. First of all, this is one of those things that every time I ask VMware and some of the engineers, why don't you just pick a number? Like with the Cisco Nexus 1000V, it defaults, so I think it is 32. You don't pick it, it's just 32. When you look at this GUI per host, it's just got all 32. You know, the answer they always come back with is, well, the more uplinks you select, the more memory it uses. Okay, well, how much memory does each one use? Yeah, I don't know. Nobody ever knows, right? So it's one of those things that, you know, you can set a couple of extra for later. You can come back later and change it. Just don't go crazy with the number right here. Hit Next. And then, well, do you want to go ahead and add all the hosts and their physical adapters to the new distributed switch? I'm going to be honest with you here. I don't see the point of this because at this point I have not created any port groups. I haven't created anything. 
I've created a blank switch. I haven't configured anything. I haven't set any options. I haven't put any VLANs in. I haven't set the MTU. I haven't done anything. So I'm going to say no. And I recommend that you say no and just do add later. Because the next thing it's going to want to know is, well, do you want to roll over the VM kernel interfaces from a vSwitch port group to a new port group? Do you want to roll this stuff over? And you can walk through this wizard and you can create things, some, some things. But you're just gonna want you're just gonna want to go ahead, configure the switch, and then roll the host over. I never see anybody do this. A couple of options here: settings being one, uh, maximum number of ports per host. You can basically set the number of network ports. So within the V switch or the distributed switch, each VM's NIC takes a port, each VM kernel takes a port, and you can set a maximum number here up to 1024. 256 is good. You know, if you're doing some kind of crazy high consolidation ratio, you know, you got a 300 to 1 VDI environment, you're just blowing it out, you may need to change that and raise that number. But, you know, again, you can also come back later, like it says here, and customize it separately. You can change this later. I suggest you stick with that. Again, this is one of these options of, why don't you just set it to a higher number? Well, the more it takes is more memory it uses. Well, how much memory is it used? I don't know. Circular conversations that we have. So I would leave it here. The only other real reason not to set a super high number is that there are maximum numbers of ports that you can have through a whole switch and vCenter wide. I think it's 30,000, and I've got that in a slide in a minute. It changes. You know, it used to be, I think, 20,000. Now it's 30,000. So you don't want to go too crazy. If I got 30 hosts and I set that, I could end up with more uh, with an unsupported configuration. So again, reasonable numbers. View incompatible hosts. If I had a host that wasn't compatible, I set this for, say, a 5.0 level virtual switch, and I got 4.1 hosts, they're going to pop up here. I don't have that issue, so we're all good to go. So again, I'm going to add later and say next. If you do want to add now, you know, you can pop this down. It's going to say, all right, you can add next. We can do this. We can do this. And it's going to go, if we say next, it's really not going to do anything here. It's not going to let you configure a lot of stuff enough to get this host up and running. Again, that's why I say add later. But I didn't want you to think I was shortchanging you by showing what it would do. So add later. Next thing it says is, do you want me to go ahead and create a default port group? And I'm going to be really cool, and I'm going to name this port group DV Port Group. And I'm not going to let you set a VLAN. Well, that doesn't really help me. Because, first of all, the name DV Port Group is not descriptive in any way, shape, or form for my environment. Probably not for yours either. And if I don't set a VLAN that I want this thing to tag, it's really probably not going to work in most environments. Because, again, we talked about this in VLAN lesson. You're going to want to let these things tag for VLANs. Most often you're trunking from the physical switches. So uncheck this box. And we're just going to say, okay, we're not going to create any port groups. I'll let you do it manually, which is what you really want. So there we go. We end up with the base distributed switch. And what we have here is the main switch and then the uplinks group. And I'll talk about these separately. An uplinks group is an important thing to understand. So first of all, let's look at the main switch. So this is the main switch. It's got all your information here. It's got your summary tab. It's got your number of hosts, your number of VMs, your number of networks, your number of total ports, available ports, blah, blah, blah. As you start rolling hosts and VMs over, these numbers will go up. Networks, we don't really have any. We will have more later as we add port groups. Ports, this is going to give you a list of all the ports and the ID numbers. So when you start adding VMs into this, you know it probably makes more sense if I show you this in a working switch. So here we can see I've got my three hosts rolled in. I've got 18 VMs, my networks. So here are all my networks, which equate to port groups. These are all my port groups. We'll talk about what port binding means here in just a bit, what we're tagging VLAN numbers what were number of VMs connected, number of ports used, if alarms are enabled. Ports tab, this is kind of important. It'll be more important later when we talk about port mirroring and NetFlow. But when you plug a VM into a vSwitch or a VM's NIC into a vSwitch, as a VM may have multiple NICs, it gets assigned a port, a port ID on the distributed switch. So Media XP here was assigned port number 11. His buddy, Media SAB, was 10. Domain controller was 1. View connection server, 0. And it's just kind of randomness. So down here's another group of them. I'm sure there's an algorithm. I don't know what it is. But it goes all the way down to 651 for right now. So if you never need to do a manual lookup, if you're doing any troubleshooting, or again, we'll talk about this with port mirroring and NetFlow because it references these port IDs, and you want to know what is port 11 because it's sending a whole lot of traffic. 
come in here, look at port 11. You can look at the VM, the Mac, the direct, if you're using VM direct path for pass through, and if the link's up and which VLAN and all that. So it's all there. Resource allocation, this is where you configure network I.O. control. We'll talk about this again in the traffic shaping lesson. Configuration, this is a GUI showing my current configuration. You will also see this for each host in the network section that we'll look at here in a little bit. But it shows my port groups are on the left and anything like VMs that I've got plugged into them. On the right are my physical uplinks, which VM NIC is plugged in and which servers they are. So you can see here that like Optimus is, has two NICs plugged in, but everybody else has four. That's just me messing around. If you look over here, I may have, and this gets a little head, but for management, I may have some of these physical uplinks as active, standby, or unused. So if I click on it, it shows which ones are being used. I'm basically bouncing across all four NICs right now, so there's nothing too exciting here. But if you only use NICs, you know, uplink 1 and uplink 2 for VM traffic, those would light up. It's just a quick way to, to see what is used by what. If we click the I information here, you will pull up either, say, CDP for Cisco or LLDP for non-Cisco. And this is very similar to what the vSwitch already does, but you can just pull in and see what it's connected to. Information here is just basic information about the port group. Virtual machines, just all the VMs that are using your distributed switch hosts, all the hosts that are using your distributed switch, and then you've got task and events, alarms, anything like that, and permissions, because you can set permissions on the switch. Now, jumping back over, let's take a look at what our settings are. So summary tab, we can do edit settings, or again, I'm right click heavy, edit settings. So here's some of the main options. This is on the main switch. They are switch wide. So first of all, Number of uplink ports. Remember how I told you you could set this later? There you go. That's where you change it. You change it, you hit OK. It's non-disruptive. Everybody goes about their business. Edit uplink names. I'll talk about this a little bit more in the lesson, but you can change the names of your uplinks, and I'll go over why in a little bit. But if you've got 10, it'll give you 10 boxes. If I've got four, it gives me four boxes, and I can change those names. Advanced. Set the maximum MTU. I'll talk about this in the jumbo frame section on traffic shaping. But basically, if you want to do jumbo frames, 9,000 byte frames, you first need to set it right here on the main switch. So we can go 9,000. Discovery protocol is enabled. I have set it for Cisco Discovery, CDP. We have the option for that, or LLDP. And if you want it to listen, or you want it to advertise, or both, I like it to do both. That way, when I go look at my physical switch, I can see you know information both ways. And then if you want to fill out information about the name and other details that might show up on CDP or something like that, you enter that there. Network adapters, let's show this to you on the working switch. So we'll do that. Right click, edit settings, network adapters. Very simply, I can select a host on the left. It shows me which NICs are on the right and how they match up to the uplink numbers. Private VLAN, I don't have anything here. We talk about this in the VLAN sections. It basically kind of lets you do layer two segmentation or VLANs within VLANs. This is configured here and we do a lab of that. NetFlow, we cover this in the uh, troubleshooting section, but basically I just can have it send IP statistics to what's known as a NetFlow collector. And I'll show you that really cool GUI, gives you charts and graphs and all sorts of stuff. And port mirroring, which is basically allows you to do traffic sniffing. And again, we do a lab of that later. So I hit OK and we're back. So those are your main switch settings. Then you have what are called uplinks. And really, for the distributed switch, you only have one set of uplinks. This is in contrast to, say, the Cisco Nexus 1000V, which does allow me to have multiple uplink groups. So I may have one uplink group connected to a DMZ network and a second one connected to the production network. And one uplink group, care, you know, the DMZ one cares about all the VLANs in the DMZ. The ones for production care about those VLANs. We can't do that with the vSphere distributed switch. If you have a DMZ network and a separate physical production network, we'll talk about how to segment that. But you only have one uplink group in each VDS. So let's click Manage. So we do the name, we do description, number of ports, standard port binding is static. We can override that and I'll show you where. Uh, then we have a whole bunch of policies here. So a couple of things. 
you're going to see a lot of this here as uncheckable. That's because these are mainly going to be set at the port group level. So if we look, what can we set? Like three whole things. By the way, this list here directly lines up to this list here. So if you want to go one by one, you can do this. If you want to scroll through all of them, you can do this. Starting at the top, security. We talk about this and talked about this in the security lesson. Again, set by port group. Ingress, egress, traffic shaping. We talk about this in the traffic shaping lesson. You can't set it here anyway. And then VLAN trunking. So by default, he's going to expect you to trunk VLANs. Now we can override this again in port groups and things like that, but you know by default it's going to expect VLAN trunking. All you're telling it here is what's the range I should expect to see. By default, 0 through 4094 is everything. Tagged, untagged, all the tagged VLANs, everything. If you follow your security best practices, you should only be configuring this for VLANs that the switch should actually expect to see from the physical world. Most people leave this like this but you can go like it says up here. I can do 1 through 20, 24, or 23, 25, 30 through 45, and set those manually, or just 0 through 4094, and just leave it. Again, up to you. Teaming and failover is a port group by setting. Active standby, same. Network resource pool is a port group setting. We'll talk about that when we talk about network I.O. control. NetFlow, we will talk about that when we talk about in NetFlow in the troubleshooting section. And then if you just want to block all ports, you can. So if for some reason you want to shut this switch down or shut this uplink group down, set that to yes and watch people complain. So there's not, I don't have a lot of great reasons to block all ports, but you can, you can tell it yes and it will absolutely do that. The next uh, set is here in advance. There's not much here. Basically, it says allow override a port policy, so you can set some things that can't be overridden, and you can edit those here, and you can configure reset and disconnect. I honestly am not sure what that does. Uh, never actually unchecked that box. So that's your uplink settings. Really, the only thing you set there is VLANs. So, you know, if you're not going to change it from all, you're pretty much done there. So you've deployed your VDS, you've looked at the uplink settings, and now you're ready to create your first port group. So you can do a couple of things. You can hit new port group or right click. I'll change it up and say new port group. And we start walking through the port group configuration wizard. So the first thing you want to do is set a name. I like descriptive names. I don't have much of an imagination, so often I will do things like, well, this is the vMotion network, and it's on VLAN, you know, 110. Completely up to you as to what you name it. What I put here doesn't mean anything. You can put whatever you want. Number of ports. Remember we talked about a minute ago that when you plug in a VM's NIC or you plug in, a, say, a VM kernel or something like that and you attach it to one of these port groups, it uses a port. So you're going to want to make sure and set this number to something reasonable. Uh, VMotion is probably one port per, per server. So I could do five and be okay. If this was VM, production VM traffic, and I had you know, a bunch of VMs and this VLAN had a slash 24 network, I may want to put 256 here. Just don't go crazy. You know, don't set it to some wacky number like 1024 when all you've got is a class, you know, or a slash 24 network. You're going to use ports and you may actually run into that 30,000 limit. So be intelligent about how you do it. Since it's vMotion, I'm going to do 10. And then VLAN type. Talked about this in the VLAN section, but it hits home here. You got none, which means untagged. VLAN, which means as a frame leaves this v, this distributed switch, it's going to stick a tag onto it for the v, for the VLAN number, and the physical uplink switch is expecting these frames to be tagged. So for this, I would do 110, like I put up here in my description. You've also got VLAN trunking. So if I actually want to trunk a set of VLANs up to my VMs, my VMs are expecting to see tagged VLAN of uh, frames. They have that special, you know, guest tagging driver installed. You can do that. Or private VLAN. And it's going to say, hey man, private VLANs are not configured. Well, you're right, I haven't configured them. You have to configure those at the main switch, as we saw at the main DVS configuration first. And then you set the options here. So for this, we're just going to do VLAN. This is probably by far the most common setting you'll use. And 110. And you're done. So it's going to finish up. It'll build it. And you're you're finished. Now we want to set some settings here. So let's go to manage. And there's a couple things. You can do a description. 
This is my vMotion port group. Number of ports and port binding type. And I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but this is where you set it either static, dynamic, or ephemeral. Uh, and it has to do with how it assigns those port numbers that we just talked about. Most of the time, you're going to leave this on static. Then we have our policies. These should look really familiar. You just saw all of these in the uplink configuration. So here's your security settings. Here's your ingress and egress traffic shaping that we talk about in the traffic shaping section. Here's where you want to come back and if you want to change your VLAN tagging information and number, you do it here. Your teaming and failover set at the port group level. This kind of confuses people because they think, well, wouldn't you set this at the uplink level? And the answer to that is honestly no. You don't because you may do different hashing types and things like that depending on the type of traffic, depending on the port group. So it's done at the port group level. By default, it's going to do just like a standard vSwitch, route based on originating virtual port ID. You've got several options, IP hash, source MAC hash, route based on physical NIC load, which is load based teaming, which is the coolest one because it actually looks at the NIC's load, and explicit failover order if you want to give it a, an explicit list. Leave that here for now. Network failover, notify switches, failback, all these are standard VMware vSwitch settings. Then you've got your active, your standby, and your unused. And we talked about this, network resource pools for network I.O. control, monitoring for NetFlow, and again, you can block all ports on this port group instead of switch wide. And down here to advance are the same to advanced settings. So really, you don't set a whole lot in here unless you want to do ingress, egress traffic shaping. You'd come do that here. If you want to change your load balancing, you'll do that here. When we talk about traffic separation, for example, if I wanted to just use VM or Uplink 4 for vMotion traffic, I can move all these down to unused and just use that guy or you know move one up here to standby. Uh, that's one option for physically separating traffic. You can go port group by port group and move these where you want them. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Hit OK. It'll save my changes. And there we go. And much like we saw in the main switch, a lot of these tabs are the same. It's just going to be specific to this port group for things like ports, VMs, hosts or hosts. If they're in the main switch, they're in this, so that's not a big deal. If you use the vShield suite, you'll see some things here. So, kind of a long lab, kind of a quick walkthrough, but honestly, the distributed switch isn't that complicated. I mean, we went through every setting that you'll see on the main switch, the uplinks, and all your port groups. It's not that complicated. So, you know, that's why it's pretty easy to go through this. So with that, I think we're done in here. Let's jump back over to the slide deck. So the next couple of slides, we'll just review a few things we did in the lab. And I actually was originally going to do these as separate labs, but it just made more sense once I jumped in there, just kind of flow through these. So configuring the main switch was pretty simple. You know, after we deployed the VDS, there were some settings we had to make. And we saw those on some of the main, you know, main switch settings private VLANs, we did our configure we could do our configuration there. For NetFlow, we'd point our switch to the main NetFlow aggregator. Port mirroring, we configure the mirroring sessions. And you know, we'll talk about port mirroring, we'll talk about NetFlow in the troubleshooting lesson, private VLANs in the VLAN lesson. For VDS MTU, the maximum transfer unit or transmission unit, we set that there. And that is the overall size. So, you know, that's the largest that the switch is going to support. Doesn't mean everything is that size, doesn't mean everything has to be that size, it's just the largest of switch supports. And we saw where you set that. So if you wanted to do jumbo frames, you'd set that to 9,000. And then the discovery protocol, Cisco, CDP, or link layer discovery protocol, if you're using non-Cisco. So like my HP lab switches I have here, do LLDP. My Cisco switches does CDP or LLDP. So it just, you know, either one works fine but usually people do CDP and Cisco network. So set the correct one, and I usually set it for both advertise and listen. Now, I showed you the uplink numbers in the switch, and one configuration item is something I don't see that's used often, but I think it should be. It's something that I think is a great idea. So when you set the number of allowed uplinks, like I did four, it'll create four kind of slots, DV uplink one through DV uplink four. If you do 20, DV uplink 1 through DV uplink 20. The idea to name these is just simple. You know, make them something that means something to you. So you may want to put it like, you know, if you have your NICs or onboard or Intel quad port or Broadcom card or, you know, something like that, name them like that. So DV uplink 1 may be onboard NIC 1. 
Second one may be onboard NIC2, then say Intel Quad 1 through Intel Quad 4. Name them after a purpose. If that's going to be the first connection to the DMZ, DMZ1 and then DMZ2, Internal 1 or Prod 1, something like that. I'm a fan of doing the first one. Name them after the NIC type. Reason being is, is you want to be sure, you know, best practice for doing network configurations is, if I've got, you know, four onboard NICs and four, say, on an add-on card for eight total, and I'm going to do some traffic separation where NFS or iSCSI runs over a pair of dedicated NICs, I want to make sure I choose one onboard and one add-on card. That way, if either one of those things fails, the other one will back it up and, and become, you know, and, and take over. If you name your DV uplinks, you can match these one for one, and that way you know it's correct. And so you, when your servers boot, you'll get a list of all your VM NICs, VM NIC 0 through VM NIC 7, if you had eight of them, and you would match them over and, cor and make it correct. And then later, when you come back to make a change or somebody comes behind you, these DV uplinks make more sense than just DV uplink 1 through DV uplink 8. So hopefully that makes sense. Again, there's no right or wrong answer here for what you name them and how you use them. I just suggest you pick something that fits and you do it. Again, this is one of those things that you can come back and change. If you name it, you know, Jason's Nick 4, I can always come back in and actually name it something more, you know, significant or informational. But I would go ahead and look at doing that as you roll out the switch. We created a port group. We saw it was very simple. And it's a, a big advantage of the, of the VDS. From simple administration's sake, it is a big advantage. Create it once, and if I have 10 hosts, 20 hosts in that VDS, all those port groups appear across all of them, named the same, configured the same, everything. If I come back and make a change later, change that VLAN number, it's automatically pushed to all the hosts. And within each port group, we saw a bunch of settings. We had the standard vSwitch security settings. We had both ingress and egress traffic shaping, which is different than the standard vSwitch. We configure our VLAN trunking and tagging. I showed you where teaming and failover is set at the port group here. And resource allocation, which is just network I.O. controls, network resource pools. And we'll talk about that in a later lesson. Ports and port binding. So we kind of touched on this as we went through the config. Talked a little bit about it. Each virtual NIC from a VM that is connected to a port group or VM kernel is uh, uses a VDS port. Ports are just kind of... These, you know, I know we use the term virtual all the time here, but it's just kind of these virtual ports. It's a, it's kind of a, you know, a placeholder in the distributed switch. And there are limits. So per host in vSphere 5, you can have up to 4,096 ports in use. Total ports per vCenter is 30,000, and it's actually a little lower in some of the previous versions. For each port group, you set the maximum number of ports allowed. So this is where I talked about if you had a slash 24, you may want to do something like a, like 256. But just use a reasonable number. You can raise this later. It's not a big deal. Cisco's Nexus 1000V defaults to 32. That's too low. I've gotten a couple of panicked calls where people are trying to deploy VMs. It kicks back and says, you don't have any, you're out of virtual ports on the switch. And people freak out, and I get calls, and it's like, well, go type this one command, and it'll raise it. Same thing here. If you hit, if you're set for 128, and you're rolling out that 129th VNIC, and it kicks back, you just go in there and raise a number but just kind of set it to something reasonable because of those maximums. When a new, NIC, a new VNIC is attached, it is given a port ID, and we saw those in vCenter. We saw them on the Virtual Distributed Switch tab where we went in and looked at the ports, and I showed you where all the different you know, VM ports and things like that, and you saw the port IDs. If vCenter is down, a port ID may not be assigned, and therefore the VNIC cannot be activated. And this is usually the case when you're doing a new VM. For some reason, you know, it's kind of hard to deploy a VM to the VDS if vCenter's down because that's kind of a... It, it doesn't really work that way. You can't really bring... You know, I guess you can bring up a VM direct connected to a vSphere host on the VDS, but you don't see that very common. The point being is, in most cases, vCenter assigns port IDs. But there are three types of port binding. And this is... I showed you this in the drop-down list. There's static, dynamic, and ephemeral. Here's how it works. Static is a default setting. Unless you have a darn good reason, don't change it. Okay, port ID is assigned when that virtual NIC in the VM is attached to a port group. When it's first attached, I give you a port ID. That is your port ID forever and ever until that virtual NIC is deleted. If vCenter's up, vCenter down, whatever, you've got that port ID, you're good to go. You don't need to go ask vCenter for another one. The beauty here 
is that if I V motion a VM from one place to another place, we can go into the VDS in there and there's some statistics that shows kind of like traffic counters, you know, how much traffic's been sent, how many frames, any errors, things like that. Since your port ID is always the same, as I vMotion VMs around, those statistics follow. It's called Network vMotion. Terrible name if you ask me, but if you ever see Network vMotion, that means when I am vMotion a VM, my network statistics follow. Then you have Dynamic. Dynamic is deprecated. You can still select it as we saw in vSphere 5, but it is deprecated and I make no guarantees of how long it's going to be around. The thing here is a port ID is assigned when the VM is first powered on. And what I mean by that is when you power the VM down, the port ID goes away. So when you power on the VM, it goes to Mr. vCenter, says, hey, Mr. vCenter, I've got one virtual NIC or two virtual NICs. I need some ports. vCenter hands them to him. What happens if vCenter's down? Yeah, good answer, right? He's not there to hand out ports. You're not going to boot that VM. So the other problem is, is that you're not going to keep network statistics between reboots or shutdowns and startups because, again, that ID could change. That's a big reason it's deprecated. Uh, it's just not a really great use case. The only other use case for this was, you know, we saw there's maximum number of ports per vCenter and per host. And the only real reason to use Dynamic was I have more VMs than I have available ports in the maximum, but those VMs aren't on all, all on at the same time, so I don't want them holding ports when they're shut down. I do a lot of vSphere design. I've never seen an environment like this. I'm sure they exist in some kind of environment where they flipped one OS and boot a bunch of VMs, do something, then shut those down and start another. Kind of a, you know, I, I've worked in high performance computing environments where we did clusters. One part of the day we'd run a Windows cluster, another part of the day we'd run a Linux cluster on the same hardware. We'd provision one, pull it off, provision the other, it's all automated. Something like that maybe, but I don't have a good use case for using dynamic. Then there's ephemeral. Ephemeral is kind of interesting. There's no real port binding. What I mean by that is a VM's port is given to it by the vSphere host. Each vSphere host has a bucket of ports. When a VM boots up on a host, that host hands it a port ID. If you vMotion that VM from host 1 to host 4, he gives up the, host I or the port ID on host 1, host 4 hands him a new one when he gets there, which means is you lose all your statistical tracking across hosts when you vMotion a VM. I see some people who use this. There's no dependency on vCenter for this. It's all done by the vSphere host. They feel it is more resilient, I guess you would say, you know, in case of a vCenter outage, but I'm not a huge fan of it. But I do see people doing this as, a, as kind of a standard. I'm not really going to argue with them. I don't see a lot of people using the network statistics a lot, so it's not a big deal to give that up. But the default is static, and it's normally the best one to stick with. And I will talk more about this vCenter dependency a little bit in the troubleshooting lesson. But again, it's not a big deal, especially in 4.1, 5.0, vSphere, anything like that. The only reason to use Dynamics if you had more VMs and are not on at the same time, then you could have port IDs. Downside is that vCenter must be a live power on those VMs. Ephemeral does not require vCenter for VM power functions, but you lose network statistics. Static is, to me, that happy medium. It's recommended. The VM owns the port ID until deleted. vCenter is not required for power functions. Statistics are kept. I don't really have a reason not to use static, again, unless you're in some weird situation where you have more VMs than ports. So VDS and vCenter and virtual vCenter. I get asked this a lot. You know, virtual vCenter is kind of a VMware recommendation best practice. I've seen it written down in some of their papers. If you ask anybody, that's what they're going to tell you because, you know, you could put vCenter in a VM and use things like HA, fault tolerance, DRS, all that good stuff along with vCenter. And there's really no reason to be concerned. It's fully supported. You can drop the host that vCenter runs on. HA will restart it on another host. It's not like the distributed switch is down or anything like that. I highly recommend using static port binding to, you know, just make sure there's no issues with VMs trying to come up because you know, I could see a situation where if you use dynamic port binding and you lost a host that had, say, 20 VMs on it, including vCenter, you don't get, well, you do get to pick the restart priority. But if for some reason vCenter can't be restarted at top priority, just something's not right, then the other host wouldn't be able to start off because they can't talk to vCenter, they can't get a port. Therefore, that's why I recommend static. 
And Duncan Epping, Duncan's a great guy. He's with VMware. He and Frank wrote the really good HA and DRS clustering book. Duncan writes a lot about the distributed switch as well. He and I have had some really good conversations. And he's got testing here that shows what happens with a distributed vSwitch and a vCenter outage. And there has been some concerns. In the past, there's been some kind of what I'd call corner cases where a long outage caused some issues. And I'll talk about that in the troubleshooting lesson. So, you know, put a pin in this. When you get to the troubleshooting lesson, we'll come back to this. It's not a big deal. It's just something to be aware of, especially right now. I expect some things will be fixed later, but for now it's not a big deal. Again, we'll talk about that in the troubleshooting lesson. But overall, no issue, virtual vCenter, running into VDS with everything running through the VDS, you know, nothing running through a, a standard vSwitch. Now let's have fun. So traffic separation in the VDS. And I don't mean that this is overly complicated. I just mean that it can be complicated. How do you do traffic separation? So we saw this in the lab. A single distributed switch can only have one uplink configuration. That means all physical NICs added to that VDS must trunk the same set of VLANs. I didn't really show you this. And actually, let me show you this now. Let's jump to the lab real quick. So in the lab, if we look at the uplink configuration, what you're going to see is that VLAN here, we set VLANs. Now, if I roll all four of my NICs into here, like I have into this switch here, summary, VDS, that means I don't get to pick and choose which VLAN some of the NICs carry. What if I have a DMZ network that is VLAN 100? My production network is VLAN 1 through 99. Well... You don't get to pick that. That is just the way it is. So what you would do is set this to be like all or 1 through 200 or something like that. And then we would get into the port groups and do different segmentations. But the point here is that you don't get to specify which NICs carry which different VLANs at this level. This is different than the Cisco switch. The Cisco switch, I can do multiple uplink groups. I can say these couple of physical connections only carry VLAN 50. These other four physical connections carry 100 through 400. You can't do that here. So we have to use some other methods for doing traffic separation and segmentation. Back to the slide deck. You have two options. And the first option is what I call the active standby unused option. Here, you have a single vSwitch or distributed switch with all your physical NICs configured as uplinks. And I'll show you how to do that in the next lesson when we do migration. But when you kind of bring a host into the switch, you pick where you, you know, which of the physical NICs you want to bring in. So if I have one distributed switch, I may pull them all in. And if I want to do traffic separation, I can go into each port group, like the NFS port group, and I'll take two NICs and set those as active. All the rest is unused. Then if I have dedicated NICs for vMotion, I'll go to the vMotion port group, move those two NICs up to active, the rest unused. VM traffic the same way. You have to go port group by port group and set active standby unused and you need to make sure to make a port group for each of the different traffic types and that's how you can do it. So if you have a DMZ network you would take the two NICs connected to DMZ put them as active, the rest unused. I think this is more complicated than the second option but some people disagree and you're free to disagree. It's your environment, do what you want to do. For this I highly suggest that you name your DV uplinks as we just talked about. If you don't do that you're going to have a much harder time keeping track of this. So you want to do that. You can absolutely have eight NICs connected to a bunch of different physical networks with different VLANs using this method. And it doesn't care. It's just going to take everything based on kind of VLANs and connectivity. And you're just going to say, okay, this port group carrying DMZ traffic, the two NICs that we have for active for that are the ones actually plugged into the DMZ network. These two NICs for the prod network are the, on this port group are active for the, and they are connected to the actual prod network. It's just a little bit more to keep track of. The second option is what I call the multiple VDS option. Yes, you can have more than one VDS in a cluster, or actually in more than a cluster, each with their own uplinks. So if you, again, you may have a virtual switch, distributed switch, just for NFS, or just for iSCSI, or just for VMs. Usually it's not, you know, too crazy, but you can do multiple distributed switches. Some people will say, well, that kind of defeats the whole purpose of doing the distributed switch. And in some cases it does, because you're going to have to roll a host into multiple switches. But 
Once you do that, you just go in there, pick your switch, add a port group, and it appears on all the hosts. I'm not sure it's any more complicated than the active standby unused. And if you get hit by a, you know, the beer truck, which one do I want to come behind you and kind of figure out? Well, if your documentation's not great, I want to figure out the multiple distributed switch option. Probably not active standby and used. But again, it's up to you. Which one you use, it depends on which one you think is easier to manage. But that's how you do traffic separation with the distributed switch. So here's a diagram. I like simple diagrams using multiple distributed switches. So here we have one distributed switch with two NICs that we have as our uplinks, and we connect those down to the DMZ network. We have one for prod connected down. For any port groups that we want to connect to here, we would put a port group here and make these two basically, well, really, since this is multiple VDS, we would just add a port group here, add a port group there. By default, they will go to the correct network. So you could have a DMZ VM port group here, a prod VM network here, and whichever one you connected your VMs into, they would go to the correct network. The table is fairly simple. This is a recommendation. It is not a what you have to do, but it gives you kind of an idea. If you're going to use this single distributed switch option and do active standby unused, I suggest you build a table very similar to this. And what we do here is we have each of the traffic types and each of the failover and configurations. So let's assume we have eight NICs. Management, port group, hopefully it's not going to be called port group one, call it port group management, VLAN, whatever. Teaming, recommend you do explicit, you don't need to load balance management traffic, and what you're going to do is say uplink one is active and uplink two is standby. If this should fail, it will just fail over to two. Vmotion, Vmotion, port group two, hopefully better name. Uh, we don't normally team these because, you know, we want to keep it specifically on a certain physical NIC. So we'll say network DMV uplink 3 is active, 4 is standby, and the rest are unused. The other vMotion interface, and the reason this is different, if you haven't looked at, say, vSphere 5, it allows you to do multiple stream vMotion. So you can actually use multiple 1 gig connections to increase your vMotion speed. Here we've got, and we're doing two of them, so for the second one, we would flip these three, four, four, three, and leave the rest unused. That's why teaming is set for none. Fault tolerance, fourth port group, explicit, DV uplink two and DV uplink one. This will take over. So we're basically alternating off of management. Should uplink one fail, you can run management and FT over DV uplink two. It's not a big deal to share for those two. And again, the rest are unused. iSCSI, if you do multipathing, multipathing, you want to use multiple NIC connections for iSCSI. It's kind of like what we're doing with vMotion. You've got to have two different port groups, and we don't do any teaming or load balancing. So we'll do iSCSI, DV uplink 5, DV uplink 6, the rest unused. And then for VM traffic, we're saying to use load based teaming with DV uplink 7 and 8, and the rest are unused. So you're just going to have to create a matrix like this. You know, this is a suggested config for a server with 8 NICs, multi link vMotion, and iSCSI. So it's a suggestion but you may want to look at doing a matrix for something like this. There is a distributed switch best practice guide from VMware that has several options for this type of configuration with some different things, you know, some other kind of reference architectures or reference designs, if you will. So you may want to Google that and take a look at it. Here is a single distributed switch using 10 gig instead of 1 gig. The idea here is to balance traffic across the two NICs. I'm going to assume this is a standard server with two 10 gig ports, not something like uh, HPC 7000 blades with Flex 10 and Virtual Connect, not something like Cisco UCS with the virtual interface cards that I can slice and dice things up, but something where I've just got two 10 gig NICs. Here, we can only do things with one and two. That's all we've got. So management is active on one, standby on two. VMotion is two and one, fault tolerance two and one. Yes, we're sharing fault tolerance and vMotion on the same connections, but it's 10 gig, remember. iSCSI, one and two, so we will offset iSCSI for vMotion and FT. This was NFS, just drop NFS in here. And then VM traffic, load-based teaming, and DV uplinks one and two. And the idea here is that you're saying, well, Jason, you're already running vMotion and fault tolerance over two. Remember, load-based teaming is your only 
hashing or load, you know, balancing type metric that looks at NIC load. So if he sees that NIC2, due to those two things, is really busy, he will hash more of the VMs across NIC1. So he will do his best to balance the load. That's one of the big benefits of the distributed switch is we can now do load-based teaming. It allows us to do some things that I would not recommend with standard, you know, round-robin load balancing, but we can absolutely do this here. So let's go ahead and we'll take a look at traffic separation in the lab. So we're just going to kind of quickly go through these using some fake configurations and see what you think. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into the lab. back in the lab with everything that we've created. So I'm just going to kind of close these guys down for a minute. So here's what your options could be. For one, I'm going to create a new switch. vSphere 5, and I'm going to say this is single VDS segmentation. I didn't know if it'd let me have one that long. And I'm going to say we've got 10 uplinks. I don't have to have 10 physical adapters to, to show you this example. I can just make these up. We say OK, we'll add later, and I didn't mean to create that default port group. Let's delete that. Done. For here, we want to basically use active, standby, and unused. So I'm going to create some port groups. The first one is going to be VM traffic. And again, I don't need to set VLAN types because we're just kind of making this up. And then we can do iSCSI. One, SCSI two, if we want to do multipathing, DMZ, and we'll just do one vMotion. So what you can do here is come in to say the DMZ network, manage this, go to teaming and failover, and set your active standby on you. So let's say nine and ten are my DMZ. So Whatever physical NICs, and again, I'll show you this when we do the migration lesson, whatever physical NICs I assign to 9 and 10, and I get to choose. So I get to pick which of my, my VM NICs, you know, that the vSphere sees when it scans the hardware and the server, which one gets assigned to 9 and 10. I know that 9 and 10 are plugged into my DMZ network. So for these, I'm going to move these down to unused. That means 9 and 10 are the only ones that are going to be used for DMZ networking iSCSI 1, I'm going to say that Teaming and Failover says I plug NIC 8 into that. So I need to move 9 and 10 down, 1 through 7 down. Done. For this, I will say we'll use the next one, which is 7. So 1 through 6, 8 through 10. For VM traffic, I'm going to say that we do 2 through, what was the other one, 6? See, I'm already confusing myself. Yeah, you can't look at ports, can't look at that. We did 7. So I'm going to say that VM traffic is... 3 through 6, 4 NICs there, and I can make this a little simpler, move all these down to unused, and then for vMotion, I could say something like, you know, explicit failover order, move all these down except for, we'll move 2 back up to standby. So what I've done is I have a single distributed switch, one set of uplinks, 10 physical ports that I'll roll into this. So each of my hosts, all 10, I'll roll into these uplink group. And then I've specified that DMZ is only serviced by NICs 9 and 10. iSCSI 1 and iSCSI 2 each get specific NICs. The VM got four NICs that they're only using, and vMotion got those. So if we go up here and look at, I believe it's configuration, we'll see that DMZ is used by 9 and 10 iSCSI 1 by 8, iSCSI 2 by 7, VM NICs get the next 4, vMotion gets that one with a failover to 2. So does that make sense? I hope so. 
All you're doing is going port group by port group specifying active standby or unused. Create that matrix on the front end. It'll make it a whole lot easier for you to walk through and do this. And that's why I say DV uplink naming is great. For example, we deploy a lot of Cisco UCS. Cisco UCS has what we call virtual interface cards. Each blade, each half width blade has two 10 gig ports, but we will often slice and dice those things up to have a total of 10 ports. So to the vSphere host, it looks like he's got 10 NICs on that blade when he really only has two. I normally name the DV uplinks like VM NIC 0, VM NIC 1, and I really have a full naming. So it'll be like VM dash VM NIC 0, VM dash VM NIC 1, then it's like FT dash VM NIC 2, FT dash VM NIC 3, etc, etc. And I name them so that when I'm looking at the VM NIC numbering, when I roll the host in, I can match it right up to the DV uplink group. It just makes things simpler, keeps me from screwing up as I'm trying to match these things up. The alternate to this, or the other option, is multiple distributed switches. So what you could do here is very simple. Create one. Goodness, can't type. Call it Nash Corp VM VDS. And I'll have four uplinks that I'll do later. And new. Say finish. And I'll add another one. I'm going to make this much simpler. Then I'll have... Nash Corp VMotion VDS 2. And I would go on and you can do this. So depending on how you actually this is that's not a great example. Because often what you'll do is you would have a main distributed switch. Remove. You would have a main distributed switch for everything, and then you may have another one for like DMZ. So let's do name is Nash Corp prod. PDS with eight connections. And under this, the main production VDS, I would have my standard production VM traffic, fault tolerance, vMotion, NFS, or iSCSI, anything like that. I would create those port groups, and you could do, say, active standby unused there. Or I could create multiples of these, one for VM traffic, one for iSCSI, one for NFS, one for iSCSI. And if I did that, then I would just come through and say create a new one. For this one, I'll say Nash Corp DMZ VDS. Only two NICs are going to that. Add later. Don't create. And when I'm rolling a host over to this, I would say which of those NICs are going to go to each one. So as an example, for the production VDS, go to host, right click, add host. And you'll see this again in the migration lesson. You get to pick like Optimus, and I've got some NICs that are currently not part of a switch. So I could say four and five are going to be rolled over. And that way you could say, okay, those are going to, these two NICs are what are connected to the DMZ network. That's the one I want to roll to the DMZ VDS, and we're good. And then I would come over here to the production and say host, right click, add, Optimus. I would say NICs 2 and 3 are going to roll into the production. And that's how you roll each one into separate distributed switches with different physical adapters into each uplink. So again, which one is right for you? That just kind of depends whether you want to uh, do a matrix of, you know, active standby and used here, or you want to have multiple distributed switches and just roll the host NICs into which one you need. Completely up to you. Both of them are fully supported by VMware. VMware normally nudges people to the single VDS option. I've given some, le uh, some sessions at VMworld where I talk about this topic, and VMworld always tries to nudge me to nudge people to the single VDS option. You'll see that in some of their documentation, but both of them are completely supported. So that's it for the demo. Let's jump back to the slide deck. Now upgrading your VDS version. We kind of hinted at this earlier. You know, new versions of vSphere add features to the distributed switch, like network resource pools in version 5. VDS runs at a certain version level. If you deployed it back when you had 4.0 or 4.1 and you upgrade your environment to 5, the VDS stays at the 4.0.4.1 version. And then you need to come in and you need to initiate the upgrade of the distributed switch. But the good part is it's easy. It's non-disruptive. You can do it any time. It doesn't reset anything and it is required to take advantage of these new features. The only gotcha 
you know, obviously you need to make sure all the hosts that are part of that switch are upgraded to the version you're moving to, and vCenter supports that version as well. Once you've got all that in play, everything else works, and you just click through and do an upgrade, and I'll show that to you right here in the lab. So like I just said, let's look at the current version of the switch and then do an upgrade. So let's jump back to the lab. Here we are again. I cleaned up some of the stuff that we just did and I created one called Old VDS. If we look at summary, we see that he is version 4. Notice there's no resource allocation tab. There's no option here for network I.O. control and IOC. You also notice there's a bang mark, which means you could upgrade this if you really wanted to and an upgrade option. So let's click upgrade and it's going to say what version do you want to go to because I'm at version 4.0 I have the option to go to 4.1 or 5 so I'm going to go to 5. Next. Any issues with host compatibility? Do you have any of these for your host part of this switch that are too old to take advantage of it? The answer to that is no. But if you did they'd show up here and you wouldn't be able to upgrade. Next. And it's going to say okay here's the name of your switch Here's the old version, here's the new version, and by the way, there's no way to downgrade. So make sure that you want to upgrade this because if you're like, oh, I need to roll in another vSphere 4.1 host for some testing, that's not going to be an option. You need to make sure there's no reason to roll this back because you cannot do it. If you're all good and happy and you know you're not going to roll back, hit finish. Take a second and ta-da, we're now at version 5. You also notice we have new tabs like resource allocation. We can now take advantage of network I.O. control. So again, non-disruptive, super, super easy, uh, no issues. Just make sure everybody's upgraded to the version of vSphere and vCenter that supports your new version of the Switch. So that's it for this quick demo. Jump back to the slide deck. So that's it for this lesson. We went over a lot of cool stuff. We started off with, what is a vSphere distributed Switch? Well, it's a distributed vSphere Switch, right? Well, yes. It gives us some really cool stuff like easier administration. It also gives us cool stuff like network I.O. control, port mirroring, net flow, traffic shaping, ingress and egress, all sorts of good stuff that we can do with it, not just, you know, a cool V-switch that we only make a change once and it appears everywhere. We also get other things like all those things and load-based teaming that I just forgot. So take all of that and you get the vSphere distributed switch. We went over terms and ideas, we went over design considerations, best practices, recommendations. We did a big lab on deploying the VDS, configuring it, looking at the VLAN trunking options in the uplink group. Then we looked at port groups and all the myriad of settings in there. And we also looked at other things like traffic separation and gave you the options of doing either active standby unused or multiple distributed switches. But a lot of different options there. And then at the end, we talked about upgrading your VDS version. Just did that. Really simple. If you install this on an earlier version, you moved to new vSphere 5.0 or maybe 5.1 one day, you want to upgrade your vSwitch version so you take advantage of new cool stuff, you just do it right there. The next lesson is going to be on migration. And what I mean by that is, let's say you have an existing vSphere environment. You're doing vSwitches. And I just showed you all the great stuff that you can do with a distributed switch, and now you're sold. But how do you migrate an existing environment? I'm going to walk you through that to show you how to do it non-disruptively. I've done large installs, middle of the day, during production, non-disruptively, and I'm going to show you that process here in the next lesson. So with that, let's wrap this up and let's get ready to start talking about how to migrate your environment.